Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at choosewood.com. But what Sabrina did that I find so engaging and necessary uh, was really give you a sense of how it was emotionally felt on the ground. A new documentary looks closely at the uprising in Baltimore that followed the death of Freddie Gray in police custody. And some of the moments it features may not be what you're used to seeing on CNN, as co-producer Bo Willimon explained on St. Louis on the Air. There are ways to respond to tragedy um, that, that, yes, at times involve anger, but also can involve um, creativity and positivity and joy. I'm Sarah Fenske. This is St. Louis on the Air. One of the films at this year's St. Louis International Film Festival may have special resonance for St. Louis viewers. It's a documentary focused on the city of Baltimore and what happened after Freddie Gray died from injuries sustained in police custody in April of 2015. Everybody here saw what happened. Automatically saw what happened in South Carolina. The police saw. Everybody here saw what happened to our brother has gone in New York. And everybody here because of video cameras had the opportunity to see what happened to our brother right here on Gilmore Projects. Freddie Gray. And by the time Freddie Gray died, rioting broke out in this town because there was so much outrage. That was like the last straw for a lot of people here. I saw it as an ordinary event because I've been dealing in the police brutality litigation world from the beginning. And when I saw what was happening, I began to understand something uh, very important, and that was there was so much pent-up rage in the communities of color. They'd had enough. They'd reached their limit. And that is from the new film Lights of Baltimore. And joining me today to talk about it is the film's co-producer, Bo Willimon. He is a former St. Louis resident, and he's perhaps best known as the showrunner for the Netflix hit House of Cards. And he joins us today. Uh, Bo Willimon, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. So I understand you were actually in Baltimore. You were there filming House of Cards when Freddie Gray was killed by police. What do you recall about how the community was feeling at that time? Uh, that's right. Uh, we filmed uh, mostly up at our stages in uh, Edgewood, which is about 20, 25 minutes north of the city. Um, but I was living down in a part of Baltimore called Harbor East. Um, so uh, every day on my commute, uh, I, I was getting on the highway and heading up to the stages. Uh, and, and in the midst of the Freddie Gray uprising, uh, you know, and I think St. Louis can really relate to this, the, the national media was portraying Baltimore as a place that was on fire, burning down, as though mm-hmm. the entire city was, um, you know, in disarray. Uh, and if you didn't know that the uprising was occurring uh, in North Baltimore, uh, you you never would have really had any evidence of it. It was mm-hmm. a, a surreal thing because people were obviously in Baltimore very aware that this was happening. Um, but it was a very specific part of the city. Uh, and then, of course, the cameras, you know, were were portraying things on fire and, and people throwing things. But most of the activity was very targeted, organized, and peaceful demonstrations against an injustice. Um, so I, I think, you know, similar to Ferguson, uh, where you did see a lot of civil unrest in a particular part of town, uh, it wasn't as though St. Louis was burning down as a whole, uh, what you had was uh, an intense level of protest um, in in a particular part of the city that was feeling a lot of pain. Hmm. So it sounds like this parallel to the Ferguson movement, which had been just about a year before, that was on your mind from the very beginning. Absolutely. uh, There's been a long history of police brutality and unjust deaths in our country, unfortunately. Uh, But I think Ferguson, uh, in many ways, uh, brought it to the national fore in terms of our, our collective consciousness in a way that uh, many incidents in the past uh, had not. Uh, and, and Freddie Gray was an extension of that uh, in terms of uh, protest and national attention. Uh, you know, 
we've seen over the last several months some major tectonic shifts in the way that our country thinks about uh, these issues and Black Lives Matter. Uh, and it's, it's, it's part of a string of, of incidents and part of a history that we're still grappling with. Uh, and Freddie Gray certainly is an important part of that story. So filmmaker Sabrina uh, Buarur, uh, she's Parisian. She was in Baltimore documenting the aftermath of this case very early on. How did you end up first uh, coming into contact with her? Uh, Sabrina was uh, writing her dissertation for a PhD at the Sorbonne uh, in Paris, but at the same time was also an associate professor at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and while she was doing that, she was also acting as a journalist for Le Monde, and so she interviewed me for Le Monde about House of Cards, uh, mm-hmm. and we we stayed in touch and became friends, and she let me know that she was working on this documentary. So I kept tabs on it for the several years that she was working on it and, and said, if you get to a point where you have a finished film or, or a rough cut and want to show me something, I'd I'd be happy to look at it. And when she did, uh, I was very impressed by the work she had done. There was still some work to do, uh, but it was it was a fully realized vision. Uh, and I asked if my production company could be of any help in trying to get it out into the larger world. And so we teamed up. And so you ended up becoming a co-producer of this film. That's how much you believed in, in this cut that she showed you. Um, what's it been like now as this film is sort of taking off and, and playing in film festivals? Do you feel ownership of it, or do you think of this as really her baby? It's definitely Sabrina's baby. I, I, I mean, and I think Sabrina would say that uh, it, it's really it's a story. It's the United States' story. It's Baltimore's story. It's, it's not her story. It's a story that she felt compelled to explore and to facilitate the the voices, uh, amplifying the voices of people from Baltimore in terms of their thoughts, their reactions, their hopes and fears of, of what this incident meant uh, mm-hmm. and how that relates to, to the greater story of our country. Uh, so as a producer, I see myself as a facilitator. Um, it, it's not about ownership. It's about Uh, trying to get important stories out into the ether and hope that they have an impact. Hmm. So she starts this film um, by saying that she saw Baltimore's beauty, its strength, and its pain, but she wanted to hear its voices. That's sort of her her statement on why she did this film. And there are so many um, wonderful and interesting voices we hear from and and interesting bodies. We see a dancer who's doing the moonwalk on the streets of Baltimore. Just some wonderful moments here. What's one voice in this film that really stands out to you? Well, you know, I, you actually went straight to the one that always pops into my mind in terms of what makes this documentary different. Mm-hmm. I mean, certainly there's a way to uh, uh, explore the Baltimore uprising from just a, a purely sort of journalistic, objective TikTok of, uh, of events, you know, in historical context. But what Sabrina did that I find so engaging and necessary uh, was really give you a sense of how it was emotionally felt on the ground, what the ripple effects of it are, uh, that, that people's real lives and futures are at stake, and also that uh, there are ways to respond to tragedy um, that, that, yes, at times involve anger, but also can involve um, creativity and positivity and joy. So when she went to great efforts to make sure that she was speaking to artists in the Baltimore community, um, and particularly black artists, about what this meant to them and how they responded with creativity and imagination. Uh, that really stuck out to me. And, and, and the very person that you're talking about, who uh, you know, he, he mentions in the film, I'm paraphrasing here, that, that you know, he, he had this sense of helplessness. What can I do? You know, how, how can I make a difference? All I know how to do is dance. Mm-hmm. And so he decided, well, if I dance across from militarized police that are in a riot line, what could they do? They, they're not, they're not going to shoot or beat a guy that's expressing joy in front of them. Um, and it's really powerful to see him do that, um, a surreal image of a person that is, you know, dancing with, with, with utter joy, but also in their anger and confusion and all the things that an artist can express across from people with guns and bulletproof vests and helmets whose job is to control uh, a crowd. Uh, and here he is being utterly and completely liberated in front of them, using his craft and his voice to make a statement. 
So one of the other voices that we hear from here, this is a guy named Devin Allen. He's a photographer who Sabrina interviewed for this film. Um, And here's what he told her about what happened after the national media left. Some places just have a riot, and you know, that might be it, it might calm down. But what happened in Baltimore was an uprising because it lasted for three weeks. You know, and it's still, to the day, the uprising hasn't stopped. You know, it's just, it's not televised as much, but we're still here fighting and finding ways to fix things. You know, the beautiful thing with my city was we took our city back. You know, the, the, the police didn't come and clean up the neighborhood. City workers didn't come and clean up. The people of Penn North cleaned up that neighborhood. They cleaned out that CVS. You know, the people, you know, and that's what Baltimore is. We're firm, we're strong, we're still standing, but we came together as one to get the job done. And I don't think any other city has done what Baltimore did. And that is Baltimore resident Devin Allen. He's featured in the new documentary, Lights of Baltimore. My guest today is the co-producer of that documentary, Bo Williman. Uh, He's a former St. Louis resident. Um, He was also the showrunner on the Netflix hit House of Cards, um, as well as a writer of other movies and and TV. Um, Bo, the the film talks a bit about how this previous unrest back in in the 1960s, when so many American cities um, suffered the same sort of movements that we're seeing today, it wasn't necessarily something we obsessed over 24-7. Cable news wasn't around yet. We didn't have Twitter yet. How do you think that immersion has changed America's reaction to these incidents? Well, I I think in a way there's there's something very interesting about the way that you frame the question, which is when you say we didn't obsess about this 24-7, who wasn't obsessing about it 24-7? I mean, certainly people that lived in communities uh, that suffered repeated and daily uh, police intimidation, brutality, and injustice had no choice but to think about it and contend with it 24-7. Mm. Uh, and I think that's what one of the things that the documentary points to, that uh, this is an, a new phenomenon, uh, and it's not a uncommon phenomenon. This is a way of life for many people, and particularly people of color in our country. Um, what you've started to see is people understand uh, that this is something that we have to pay attention to uh, in a far more frequent and active way. Um, uh, you know, there was a feeling probably among some that Ferguson came and went, uh, and that Baltimore came and went, and perhaps Freddie, uh, and, excuse me, perhaps George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others will come and go. Um, but I think that's less and less the case. Certainly for the communities in which those injustices happen, it doesn't go away. Mm. Uh, and, and I think it's really important to, to point a finger at the language that we use, and the film does this as well, in terms of, say, riot or uprising or unrest. These are very loaded and important terms. A riot insinuates that you have a public that is running rampant um, without any organization or sort of you know, uh, um, positive agenda. Uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Portland over the last several months um, trying to document the uprising that's been happening there over 160 days of sustained protest. Uh, and it's typically referred to as, as, as riots, when in fact they're very targeted actions uh, in order to illustrate the asymmetric state force that law enforcement uses um, to, to try to control and silence protesters. Uh, if you look at Ferguson, you had hundreds of days of protest. Um, the national media paid attention for a minute uh, when the National Guard was rolling through and you saw walls of tear gas, but people kept showing up long after people were paying attention, and, and the same goes for Baltimore. Uh, for, for the people in these communities, um, th- this is something that they have to contend with long after people stop paying attention in the hope with documentaries like this. Uh, in the national conversation we're having about these injustices is that we don't, we stop ignoring it, uh, and that we really invest in these communities uh, in, in, in a future thinking sort of way, uh, and that we keep our eyes open to how prevalent this is, not just in the communities we've mentioned in this conversation, but really, you know, almost every community across the nation. Well, I want to bring it back to you in just our last question here today. Actually, maybe I've got two more questions. But um, I know you did grow up in St. Louis. You weren't born here, but your your family moved here in time that you graduated from high school here. How do you think that time in, sh- in St. Louis shaped the way that you see the world and shaped the way you're looking at what's going on now in Portland and, and what you saw in Baltimore as well? 
Well, my upbringing in St. Louis is transformative for me. Uh, my dad was in the Navy for 31 years. When he retired from the Navy, we moved to St. Louis so that he could go to Wash U Law School to, to start his uh, whole second career. Um, I ended up going to John Burroughs, uh, which is an excellent school that really instilled in me the love for the arts, had an amazing uh, theater program. Uh, people like John Hamm and Ellie Kemper graduated from that school, too. Mm-hmm. And I think that really set me on the path to wanting to be an artist. Um, and then growing up in St. Louis, the city, um, you know, St. Louis has a rich tradition of the arts uh, for a city of its size. Um, you know, it, it's also a, a real cross-section of America in terms of, like, its full political spectrum. Um, it really is middle America in all the best and worst ways. And, and so I, I feel like in terms of a great education and in terms of really living in a part of the country um, where you have to contend with the, the full identity of who we are, um, it, it really shapes me. Hmm. Well, it's not just that this documentary is part of the St. Louis International Film Festival. You're also teaching a free screenwriting class. That's on November 21st. Um, and if people want more information about that, you can find that at cinemastlouis.org. Um, should people already be relatively experienced writers to enroll in this class? No, not at all. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my, my approach is that uh, a writer is a writer is a writer whether uh, you're contemplating that for a screenplay or whether you've written 20 of them. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to talk with and share whatever little kernel of wisdom I've uh, amassed learning the hard way over the years with anyone who cares to join in. And I would just like to say we're really honored to be part of the St. Louis International Film Festival. Uh, you know, uh, Cliff and his staff and, and everyone that has uh, really made it a, a relevant and important regional festival over the years has done an extraordinary job this year uh, adapting to the pandemic uh, and, and really put together an incredible slate of films as they do every year. So we're really honored to be a part of it. Well, and we're really honored you were able to join us today. So that feeling is mutual. Uh, Bo Willimon, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.